You know, once again, welcome Comfish 2022. It's really nice to be gathering back in back in person, and you know, it's not possible to do without the help of our sponsors, North Room Bank and Highmark Marine Fabrication, being being some of them. Um, this year, we are um, doing hybrid hybrid forums, and we are experiencing some technical difficulty. Those online haven't been able to see the slides, but we're working on that now. So for those of you in the room, you get the benefit of, benefit of having a Nat Nichols here in person and being able to see the slides. So, so we're working it through. But um, so thanks again. Next, we're going to hear a Gulf of Alaska Tanner Crab Management and Status Update from uh, Nat Nichols. Nat is the Alaska Department of Fish and Games Area Biologist for Commercial Groundfish and Shellfish Fisheries in the Kodiak, Chignik, and South Alaska Peninsula Management Areas. He primarily works with participants engaged in commercial Pacific cod, black rockfish, tanner crab, dungeness crab, red sea cucumber, and weather, gains, weather vane scallop fisheries in the Gulf of Alaska between Kodiak and Dutch Harbor. So thank you, Nat, and come on up. I appreciate you being here. Let's give Nat a round of applause. Thanks. Thank you, Teresa. Appreciate that. Um, yes, thanks for everybody for coming. Um, Apologize to those online. This is just a private show for those here at the Kodiak they Inn. See you. They so, see you oh, good, good. Well, they just can't see the slides, so I'll try to describe them. Um, again, as Teresa said, I work for the Alaska Department of Fish and Game. I'm the area manager for commercial shellfish and groundfish in the Kodiak, Chignik, South Alaska Peninsula areas. Uh, this presentation is just going to be sort of a state of the state of Gulf Tanner Crab, uh, Kodiak, and westward. Um, again, I'm not driving my slides, so my partner over here will do it for me. Um, we'll be starting with an overview just to get reoriented the areas we're talking about. Uh, we'll look at a, an overview of the fishery from sort of inception through the current time. Uh, we'll look at uh, sort of more in-depth of the most recent fishery we had here about two months ago, 2022 in January. Uh, we'll look at the survey. Uh, we'll look at uh, recent stock trends, and then we'll look at uh, some recommended updates to the harvest strategies that are being recommended um, for the Alaska uh, Board of Fisheries, and that meeting starts um, on Saturday here, so we'll go over that. That's Proposal 268. Um, so these are the areas we're talking about. Uh, we've got the Kodiak area, a bit of a click, uh, Chignik area, another click, and South Peninsula area. Um, these areas all have their own distinct management plans and tanner crab fisheries, their own distinct fleets, permits. They're separate fisheries, but they share a lot in common. Um, they're pretty similar uh, the way they operate, but they do all have their own flavor, and that comes from you know, preferences from the local fleets. Um, here we are looking at, uh, you know, the best way to describe these fisheries would be local, small boat, fast-paced, uh, high value. You know, these really, these really are pretty fast-paced fisheries. Uh, they occur in the winter. Uh, we start in January 15. Uh, one unique aspect of these fisheries is daylight fishing hours only, so we only operate gear between eight and six, and that's to slow the pace of the fishery. Um, they're pot gear fisheries, generally low pot limits, 20 to 30 pots per vessel, depending on which area we're talking about or what the GHLs are. Those can change a little bit. Um, we're looking for a five and a half inch male crab in these fisheries. Um, there are vessel size limits uh, that are different. Kodiak, being more of a big boat town, has a 120-foot vessel size limit. Um, Chignik and South Peninsula are 58-foot limits, and the permit types are different. Kodiak is a limited entry fishery, whereas Chignik and South Penn are open access fisheries. Uh, this slide here mostly uh, is just here to illustrate this history of the fishery. You can see um, on the right-hand side, we've got uh, Kodiak, Chignik, and South Penn going from top to bottom. The left-hand axis is harvest in uh, pounds, and that correlates to the bars there. And on the right-hand vertical axis, we've got uh, number of fishery participants or number of vessels, and that correlates to the lines. Uh, I'll note that these axes are scaled differently, so um, they're not comparable between fisheries. But the basic idea here is that the trends are all similar across all these Gulf fisheries, where they developed in the 60s, uh, peaked in the 70s, declined through the 80s, and then we had these periods of fishery closures through the 90s. Uh, the current harvest strategies for all of these areas were, uh, were adopted in 1999, and then we've had um, lower harvest um, in the, the time period of the current strategy. 
Um, that's highlighted here. So this is 2000 through present. Um, in the bottom left-hand corner here, we've just got a kind of a very high elevation summary of what these fisheries look like. You can see that Kodiak here is you know, open more frequently with 17 seasons in that time period. Uh, more vessels and a higher average GHL. Chignik uh, is open the least frequently with the smallest fleet and the smallest GHLs and South Peninsula is somewhere in the middle. One more. Um, this figure here is just looking at the most recent 2022 commercial fishery that occurred in all three of these areas. Uh, we'll just walk through Kodiak as an example. You can see the, the GHL or the quota was 1.1 million pounds. We had 86 vessels participating. The season lasted for eight days. Uh, we harvested just over 1.1 million pounds. Um, price was excellent this year, over $8, something like $8.25. Um, so that works out to about $9.4 million for the Kodiak fishery in those eight days. And if you divide it by the number of vessels, it's approximately you know, $109,000 per vessel. Uh, one thing to note here is that if you look to the right at the Chignik and South Peninsula fisheries, you can see that the quotas are different and the number of participants are different. But if you look at the bottom row there, uh, the X vessel value per vessel is actually pretty similar across all three of these fisheries. Next slide. How do we have a fishery? How do we decide to get there? Next slide. Um, we do a survey first. So this is the state's research vessel, um, RV resolution. It's right over there in Dog Bay. Um, we've been doing this survey for a long time with this vessel and it makes for a really robust data series. We, since 88, we've been using the same vessel, the same net, the same survey grid and the same survey timing. So that gives us you know, almost 40 years of data to look back on that's really robust and comparable. Um, the sort of foundation of our harvest strategy is taking an individual year's catch and comparing it to the averages from that time series. And you can feel pretty good about those comparisons when your time series is so you know consistent and been done in such a consistent manner. Next slide, please. Um, just to have a look at where the survey grid occurs. You can see that we do about 370 stations a year between Kodiak and Dutch Harbor, mostly inshore. Um, and the survey grid is designed to sort of cover areas of historic tanger crab harvest. So that's um, why you see uh, the stations where they are. Um, takes about 75 days at sea to complete these stations, starting in about June, finishing up in September. Next slide. What's the survey say? We've got all this years of data behind us. What are the trends? Well, this is probably the most simplistic way you could look at these survey results. This is Kodiak, Chignik, South Peninsula, Tanner Crab Abundance, all lumped together, all sexes, all sizes, 1988 through 2021. And you can see a couple things that are notable. One is the trend appears to be increasing. And two, beginning in about 2001, we start to see this uh, periodic recruitment cycle beginning. Um, as Dr. Daly mentioned in his presentation, that's not unique to the Gulf tanner population. We see that in other tanner stocks, but um, it became really pronounced in, in the Gulf here beginning about 2001. And we've now had four of these major recruitment events every five to seven, seven years. So 2001, 2006, 2013, and the most recent one here, 2018. Next slide. So this is the same data, but um, we're adding a different component here. Now we're looking at uh, the size frequency of these crab. So on the left-hand vertical axis, we've got the number of crab uh, along the bottom. We've got the size of crab in millimeters. And then along the right-hand axis, we've got uh, year going back in time there. If we could have a click. Um, this yellow line here uh, indicates about 140 millimeter crab. That's a legal size. So you'll know everything in uh, to the right of that line and lighter shades, those are the legal crab that the fishery is targeting. So, you know, the takeaway there is it's, um, you know, pretty small portion of the population. Most of the action happens in the sublegal sub population. And then, you know, a small percentage of the stock spills over into that legal size. Uh, next click. Uh, one more click. Um, so you can see here, we've got these three large recruitment events. This is the recruitment event that occurred in 2006. And what we're trying to point out here is that the survey is really good at capturing these trends. We see these crab when they're about the size of a half dollar. That's about the first time our net's able to sample them well. And then we, uh, the survey does a really good job of picking them up every year after that. Every year they're a little bit bigger and there are fewer of them because there's a pretty high natural mortality on a small crab. They fit in a lot of different mouths 
channels, um, they die for a lot of different reasons. Um, but we can follow these three pulses here. If we have another click, this is the 2013 group and the 2018 group. So you can see, we'll go one, yeah, it's fine right there. This 2018 group, you can see was really big and has persisted pretty well. Every year since then, we can see that they've grown, there's fewer of them, um, but they're doing what they should. And you can see there's a portion of that group that's in the lighter shaded uh, bars there. And that's what uh, was legal in last year's survey and we fished on here in January, 2022. So let's look at this group in a little more detail. One more click here. So there's gonna be oh, several slides that look just like this. So I'll orient you to this one. This is Kodiak only. Um, and this is just uh, just for, you know, the same trends exist through Chignik and South Bend, but I'm using Kodiak as an example. On the left-hand axis, we've got number of crab. These are all male crab. Um, on the bottom here, we've got the size of these crab all the way from, it looks like what, maybe 15 millimeter up to 160. So the full gamut you'd expect to see in a stock. Um, we've got these two lines here. If we have a click, I've got them highlighted. Everything to the right of the dotted line is a sexually mature crab. And everything to the right of the solid line is a legal crab that the fishery is going to target. So this slide right here is 2017. This is sort of what you might think of as a baseline. There's nothing really exciting in uh, the, you know, the structure of this stock right here. Um, everything sort of just humming along. We've got every size of crab you might want. And I'll also note that we've got these colors and those indicate shell condition. So red is gonna be a soft crab, newly molted, actually pliable and soft. Blue is what we're looking for. That's, a, that's what the fishery wants. That's a new shell crab. So this is a big, pink, shiny, iridescent, beautiful tanner crab. Uh, by the time we get to green, now we're looking at an old shell crab, still a nice looking crab, but starting to get a little dirtier, browner, scratchy, you know, maybe um, worn tips on them. And then you can see the black is barely visible, but those are going to be your very old shell crab. I mean, these are old barnacle bill type crabs. Um, oh, anemones, missing legs, barnacles, you know, really on their last legs. Um, so we'll just advance through here to the next slide. So boom, 2018, all of a sudden we have this huge influx of small crab. This is great. Um, this is the biggest estimate we've ever seen. We estimated in the Kodiak area that this was 272 million crab in the water in 2018. Um, you know, it's hard to try and translate that into what it means four or five years down the road as far as legal crab, because we know there's a phenomenally high natural mortality on these crab, and a lot of them aren't going to get to a legal size, so we try not to get too excited. Uh, the 2013 group did not survive particularly well, so we tried to sort of temper our enthusiasm when we saw this, but this was a good sign, and you can even see that there's sort of a, there's a bimodal kind of, there's two, two peaks in these small crab, meaning we probably are looking at two strong year classes of crab. Uh, there's a really wide uh, based to the size frequencies there. So this was a good group of crab. And if we can advance through here, we'll look at them in uh, 2019. Sure. There we go. Okay. 2019, they're getting bigger. There's a little fewer of them. One more. 2020, still looking good. And 2021. So this is what we saw last year. So we've seen this progression. We first saw them and we've tracked them through the population. And what's important here now is we've got the majority of them past that mature mark. So the bulk of this population is now sexually mature and reproducing. And we've got a good bit of them that are past that legal mark. So right there, circled, that's what we turned into uh, this fishery that we had in January. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, one more. Okay. Um, so, I mean, the question here is, how do we get from survey to fishery? You know, we know what the survey is, we know what the fishery looks like, how do we connect the two? Well, that's what we call a harvest strategy. Um, and it's functionally the agreed upon set of rules and math that we use to translate those survey results into, you know, a currency that the fishery can use. So we've got biological components, we've got some math, and we've got some management components, and we'll look at those here more in detail. Um, you can go ahead to the next one, that's fine. Yeah. So the, the first set, you know, we, we look at so what we can call minimum stock size thresholds. You know, we look at the survey results and we compare those to those historical averages that I talked about. If we've got a lot less than average and we don't even meet those minimum stock size thresholds, which are 50% of average is the one we use, um, we don't consider a fishery after that. We just move on. Um, if we do meet that threshold, then what we do is we move on to the control rule. And that's functionally a mathematical equation that helps us input mature male and female crab into it. And it spits out a currency that the fishery can operate on. And that's, that's legal male crab. We then take that maximum GHL from the control rule and we compare it to a set of management thresholds. Um, 
in the form of minimum GHLs functionally. I mean, you could imagine a scenario where the harvest control rule spit out a maximum GHL of 12,000 pounds. Um, that's going to cause some management difficulties. These fleets are pretty good at catching crab and we would have a pretty challenging time trying to manage 12,000 pound quota. So most of these fisheries have a, a minimum GHL of you know, 200 or 400,000 pounds, depending on where you are, just for manageability purposes. Um, if it passes, if the, you know, if all these hurdles are passed, we get to a fishery. Uh, next slide. So why, what are we looking to change in this harvest control rule or in these strategies? For one, um, I'll just note that uh, as a highlight, these strategies are, are working well. Um, there's nothing broken here, but we um, have learned a lot based on some of the work that's gone into the Bering Sea. And uh, like I said, these strategies are from 1999. Our understanding of tenor crab has improved in the last 21, 23 years. Um, so we've got some new information to offer there. Uh, there's about three years of work that went into these updated strategies that we're proposing at the board. Um, and they've been documented in this paper here that anybody could read if they were really interested in the details. And I'm always happy to discuss that with anyone. Um, but the kind of the takeaways here are we think that the, the updated strategies incorporate better science. They're simpler, easier to communicate, and they actually result in, in modestly improved yield um, for participants. Um, one of the biggest components that we're adding here is females. And we'll talk about that quite a bit more moving on, but the, the current strategy ignores females entirely. The new strategy um, incorporates female abundance. Um, and we're also, like I said, we're looking to um, incorporate an additional 23 years of survey data from 99 to 2021 that aren't even taken into account in the current strategy. Um, and that's the newest, best information. I think it's appropriate to incorporate that. Um, next slide, please. So just in more detail, what are these, you know, the biological components that we're looking at tweaking? Again, these are the, the time series that I'm talking about. Uh, currently we're using 77 through 99. Uh, we're recommending that we update from uh, to 88 to 2021. Um, the reason we wanna bring the tail end from 77 up to 88 is because 88 is when our current survey starts where it's same vessel, same net, same grid, everything's real consistent. Um, and the reason we wanna move the end from 99 up to 2021 is because we have the data and it's the most recent best available data. So it makes sense to use it. Um, we, because we're changing the time series, we automatically need to recompute the biological thresholds because those thresholds are simply just an average of the time series. You change the time series, the average changes. Um, the new strategy is also looking to um, bring maximum harvest rates more in line with, with management practices. Um, I'll talk, you know, the, that relates to the next one here. The current strategy has this sort of course on off switch type. Um, action to it. And we're looking to incorporate a ramp harvest control rule. And what I mean there is the current strategy says, if you meet your minimum stock size threshold, um, you go straight to your maximum harvest rate of 30% of legal males, regardless of how far over the threshold you are. If you pass your threshold, go straight to the top 30%. Um, the harvest strategy we are recommending is a ramp. It's more similar to what is used in the Bering Sea, where as abundance declines and you approach your threshold, uh, the harvest rate on legal males is automatically reduced because you know you're getting close to your threshold. And this final piece is um, we've uh, piggybacked on some work from the Bering Sea and uh, found a way to incorporate female abundance into the decision making in the form of a female dimmer, um, which I'll talk about here in the next slide. So this figure is um, a little hard to look at and understand and definitely hard to understand if you can't see the figure at all. But um, just to orient everyone here in the room, the bottom axis is an input that's mature male abundance. The right hand axis is an input that's uh, mature female abundance and the left-hand axis is the output. That's where um, this control rule puts out a harvest rate on legal males. So if I have a click, that's where we wanna be. This is a 20% exploitation rate. If both mature males and mature females are above average, uh, the harvest rate's gonna be 20%. This is where we'd like to be. If either mature female or mature male abundance falls below average, click, we find ourselves in the ramp here. Depending on how far below average we are, we could have a exploitation rate or a harvest rate somewhere between five and 20%. Um, next click, please. If the mature male abundance falls below 50% of average, uh, the fishery's closed. And that's what I've been referring to sort of as that's a minimum stock size threshold. And uh, that's unchanged. That's the same in the current strategy as in the proposed strategy that we're, or the, the up, proposed updated strategy. 
Next slide. So why would we want to use a female dimmer? Well, simply females are important. It doesn't take a very deep understanding of reproductive biology to understand you're going to need some females in the population to maintain that population. And as I said, the current strategy ignores them entirely. You, we could find absolutely zero crab in the fishery currently or in the survey and still have a fishery. Um, why would we want to use a female dimmer? Like, how does it work? So if you look over on the right hand side, and if you also remember some of the figures from uh, the previous presentation, we see the same trend in the Gulf as we do in the Bering Sea, where female abundance trends are a bit of a predictor for uh, male abundance trends. So you can see this is the same figure that we looked at earlier, but now we've got it split out from males and females. Females are the dotted line, and you can see in each one of these abundance pulses, we see the females declining first. So the dimmer does uh, several things. For one thing, if, if we're at the tops of these peaks, um, it maximizes harvest when the crab are in a condition that's good for the fleet. New shell, high abundance, good fishing, right? Um, if we start to see female abundance declining, the female dimmer will automatically reduce exploitation on the legal males, and that's for two, two reasons. For one, we know that that's likely an indicator of declines in the males that are coming within a year or two. And two, we want to preserve those males to mate with the females from the next group because we have this sort of staggered maturity pattern where the older males from one group are retained in the stock long enough to mate with the new females that are coming up because the uh, maturity cycles of these two segments of the population are staggered in such a way that that happens. Um, that's important and we wanna let that happen. So next slide, please. Um, these are, this is just a way to visualize how the abundance on the right and the ramp on the left are tied together. Um, so we've seen both these figures already and I've talked about them. If I could have a click, please. So if we're at the top of one of these abundance cycles, everything's above average, we get this 20% exploitation rate. Next click. As we start to fall off the back of one of these peaks, um, abundance is now um, below average. Um, we start to taper off and when we get to the bottom, uh, fisheries close. Um, I'll just sit here for a minute and if we look at the figure on the right, this really cyclical boom bust um, uh, pattern in the population is, is challenging for management. You know, if this thing was more of a steady state, you know, if you remember from Ben's presentation, there's a number of different ways, we, you know, steady state, cyclical, spasmodic. If we were a steady state, you know, calculating um, GHLs year to year um, would be quite a bit easier. But dealing with these really um, wild swings in abundance is difficult. Uh, that being said, we think that this ramped control rule deals with it pretty well. Um, so we're, we're pretty pleased to be um, bringing this forward. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, finally, we've got some recommended updates to the management components. So these are components that are entirely separate from biology, right? I mean, pot limits is a management component, season date, uh, things like that. Um, in the Kodiak district only, we're recommending that we reduce the minimum GHL from 400,000 pounds to 100,000 pounds. And we're also um, recommending that uh, we could have a fishery with just one section open. Uh, currently, the harvest strategy says you need to have two sections open. Uh, we're offering these as something for the fleet to consider, um, but basically because we've had improvements in uh, communication with the fleet since 1999. I mean, we've got a the fleet does awesome at reporting to us. We feel like we've got the tools to manage a smaller fishery than we did in 99. Everybody's got inreaches, everybody's got sat phones, everybody's got satellite tag phones. Um, so we think we can offer this as a, uh, you know, it's something to reflect that. Next slide, please. Um, this is probably the slide people care about more than any others. This is the results. This is what do we get out of all this. Um, so what we've done here is we've taken the current harvest strategy and we've taken the updated harvest strategy and we've gone back to 2001 and we've input the survey results into both strategies from 2001 through 2021 and compared the results. Essentially, what's the difference between the current strategy and the new strategy? Well, um, and we chose three metrics that are probably pretty interesting to anybody uh, who's active in the fishery. Frequency, how, how often is the fishery open? Uh, average annual harvest, so how big is the quota in any given year, and how big is the actual catch over that full time span, 2001 to 2021. Um, you can see in Kodiak, really no difference. Same number of fishery openings, um, annual catch and total catch is about the same. Um, Chignik, you get a few more fisheries. When it is open, um, harvest is a little bit bigger, um, but the total harvest over that time period is really about the same. 
And South Peninsula, you get a few fewer fisheries, but when it is open, annual harvest is bigger and total harvest is actually bigger over the time series too. So you know, the way of looking at this in my mind is we've got a plan that uses the best available science. We've updated it. Um, we feel good about it. It's simpler. It may not seem simple, but it's simpler than the current plan, believe it or not. It's easier to communicate and uh, we get modest improvements in uh, outlook for participants. Um, so we kind of view this as being pretty win-win. We're pretty pleased with this. Uh, next slide, please. Just to wrap up, um, regional tanner crab stocks appear to be trending up. The outlook for 2023, you know, we remember seeing those big blobs of crab moving forward uh, is positive. Um, we, we think that next year looks pretty positive and potentially, you know, a year or two after that even, while we'll still be working on this 2018 group of crab, hopefully. Um, current harvest strategies are performing well and we think the recommended updates will just further improve them. So we're, we're pretty pleased with all that. Next slide, please. Um, happy to take any questions. This is uh, our research vessel. This is probably somewhere on the east side last summer. Um, a lot of crap. Well, thank you. Nice to end on a positive note on the presentation, too. Well, we do have some time for some questions. Uh, if anybody would like to ask Matt any questions, please jump up to the mic. I see a lot of camp fishermen in the room. Oh. Uh. I was just wondering, um, and thank you for the presentation, but this your change in management strategy, it goes to the Board of Fish? Saturday. And then what happens then? Do they, would they go ahead and approve it or kind of? So there'll be discussion. They'll, I think they're scheduled to deliberate on it on Wednesday. Um, if it's approved, it'll go to the um, governor's office. It would, it would be in play for next year, if that's the question. That's exactly, yep. thanks. Let me know if any questions come online. Anybody have any more questions? Can you go to the microphone, please, sir? Thank you. Is the state doing anything to manage the unlimited trawl bycatch of crab? The state is um, painfully aware of trawl bycatch issues in the Gulf. Um, I don't get a day that goes by where I'm not discussing it. Um, I, you know, I am currently in contact with the governor's bycatch task force. It is. Um, if the question is, are we aware of it, and is it something we're concerned about and working on, the answer is yes. No, that, wasn't, that wasn't the question. It's just, is the state doing anything? Uh, that's, a, that's a big question. Um, you know, the state has fairly limited authority to direct uh, federal fisheries in federal waters, but we do have our channels to talk with our federal counterparts, and those are um, being addressed as well as we can. Any other questions for anybody here? All righty. Great. Well, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Matt.